China's famous Yangtze River has already reached its highest recorded water level in half a century. Now, flood warnings for the Yellow and Hua rivers have been issued, but China's rainy season has just begun. Chinese authorities are taking extreme measures to get flooding under control, including blasting open parts of a dam. And in one small southern town, over 10,000 have been trapped by floodwaters. Concerns are rising over China's food supply. Flooding in southern and central regions, plus drought in the north, have hugely reduced the country's viable crops. Two Chinese hackers affiliated with the Communist Party were indicted in the U.S. for stealing intellectual property, including information related to the virus. And $60 million cash was found at the home of a Chinese official. But he's not the first one to do it. That's after he's been put under investigation for corruption. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Floods have been raging in China for nearly two months now. The country's famous Yangtze River has already reached its highest recorded water level in half a century. But if history is any indicator, China's rainy season has just begun. It usually lasts from the second half of July to the first half of August. Flood warnings for the country's two longest rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, as well as the Huai River, have been issued. The Huai River is located between the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. It's been dubbed the most difficult river to manage in China, thanks to its tendency to shift and move. A red-level flood warning, the highest possible level, was issued on Tuesday. The Yangtze River's second-highest flood record this year was recorded at the Three Gorges Dam over the weekend. But amid heavy rain, a new wave of floods is forming and will soon make its way towards the dam. A band of strong rainstorms in the area has since moved further north. As for the Yellow River, a warning was issued on Monday ahead of its second wave of flooding. That's as the area surrounding the upper reaches of the river imposed a level 4 emergency response, the lowest, least dangerous level, despite the danger. The river's flow rate has already reached 3,000 cubic meters per second, and forecasters say it'll continue to rise. The Yellow River's first peak was recorded a month ago, when it first clocked in at about 2,000 cubic meters per second. The Yellow River Committee predicts the flood crisis will extend to even more provinces and regions, including Qinghai, Gansu, Ningxia, and Inner Mongolia. Over 10,000 people in a small town in southern China are trapped due to the flooding. Local authorities took extreme measures to tackle the flood water, like blasting open a dam. And Didi's Juliet Song has the story. China's southeastern Anhui province is now in an urgent situation. In one of the towns in the region, over 10,000 people are trapped due to flooding, waiting to be rescued. We don't have any food here. Now there's neither water nor electricity, nothing. The flooding has devastated some local businesses. Many of the local factories make a living producing down products. In some factories, the flood water washed away all the down they have. Authorities say most of those trapped by the flooding are children and the elderly. Mr. Yu, who works in Shanghai, was rushing home, trying to help evacuate his eight family members who were trapped on the second floor of their home. The water has flooded the first floor of the house. On Saturday, local authorities raised the flooding warning alert to its highest level. Heavy rain and massive flooding from upstream caused water levels in Anhui province to quickly rise. On Sunday, a major river in the region saw its water level nearing a historic high. At 3 a.m., Chinese authorities took extreme measures and blew open a dam on the river. The flood water then flew into two buffer areas. State media said the move is expected to reduce the water level by almost 30 inches. They said people living in the buffer areas have been evacuated, but didn't specify the numbers. Chinese authorities used the same tactic in 1998 during China's worst flooding in recent decades. On Monday, after another major river saw its water going above its highest warning level, authorities ordered another dam on the river to discharge the flood water. Water spilled into another buffer area with a population of almost 200,000 people. Authorities say over 2,000 have been evacuated. On China's popular social media site Weibo, the flooding is getting little attention. 
Trending keywords are celebrity news, popular dramas, and virus vaccine achievements. Reporting by Xiong Bin and Juliet Song, NTD News. This year's harvest is coming up empty in China. Flooding in the southern and central regions, plus drought in the north, have hugely reduced the country's viable crops. Take the city of Anxi inside Hubei province, where recent floods have been getting worse. More recent videos show some crops in the city have been soaked. A woman in the video explains that there used to be a road under what's now a completely submerged area. In the video, she says she estimates the water is around six feet deep. She also points to fields of corn in the area, all underwater. Elsewhere, a field of corn is in a similar state. And for around a month, these fields have more closely resembled a lake. Besides the country's floods, northern China is now suffering from a drought as well. According to Chinese media, the continued drought in Ganshu province has severely stunted the area's production of wheat, corn and other crops. A local resident said he's never seen such a dry year in all of his 50 years. A recent video showed a woman from China's Xinjiang region pointing to the area's seemingly endless wheat fields. But she says there won't be a good harvest. That's because this year's wheat crop has died due to the drought. And in the northeastern provinces of Heilongjiang and Liaoning, crops are suffering extreme temperatures. According to Chinese media, the highest recorded temperature there has exceeded 100 degrees, and it's having a big impact on corn production. So far, no mainstream media outlets in China have reported on it. Now we look at the response to the natural disasters made possible only through the Internet. China has suffered from several natural disasters in recent months. In a series of posts on Twitter, a netizen commented on the situation. According to him, the worst part is that if it were not for social media, people wouldn't even know about the country's widespread flood crisis. He says the regime appears to be absent amid the trouble, with very few leaders visiting the affected regions. He added that a few officers and soldiers have been trying to discharge and mitigate the flooding, but no one really helps the people suffering. And only a few low-level officials have told people to evacuate with their families and friends. He noticed that authorities' rescue measures and the number of volunteers coming in to help are becoming fewer and fewer. People in affected areas seem to have been abandoned. The netizen calls it collective indifference after people's trust in the regime has been repeatedly destroyed. Inside China, he said society is becoming disorderly. And outside China, the country's national credibility in the eyes of the rest of the world has become bankrupt. He says it's because no officials want to take responsibility when China's power isn't supervised and controlled. He adds that the difficult situation China is now facing, including its economic difficulties, is the inevitable outcome of an inefficient system that lacks accountability. Now to corruption in China. According to authorities of Sanxi province, the CCP branch head and director of the province's financial office, Jinghui, is currently under investigation due to serious violations of discipline and law. A local media reporter published in his social media WeChat that about $60 million in cash was found hidden in Jing's home. He quoted an internal source. It is commonly known that many corrupt officials in China hide cash obtained through bribery in their homes. This amount, equivalent to nearly $60 million, exceeds that of a deputy director of the coal department of the National Energy Administration. $28 million in cash was found in his home in 2014, weighing over one ton. Sixteen money counters were used for counting this money, causing four of them to burn out on the spot. And a former chairman of China, Haorong Corporation, had $38 million in cash found across several of his properties after he was charged with corruption. The size of this amount of money was three cubic meters large, but even this was not the entirety of his corrupted cash. The local media reporter's internal source also revealed a former director of the Sanxi Rural Credit Corporate Union was also found to be hoarding cash with $10 million in his home. Two Chinese hackers affiliated with the Communist Party were indicted for allegedly stealing intellectual property. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the hackers and what they're accused of going after, which included COVID-19-related information. 
The Justice Department says the two hackers, part of China's Ministry of State Security, stole hundreds of millions of dollars in trade secrets, intellectual property, and other valuable information globally. They apparently also went after COVID-19 related intelligence. The campaign targeted intellectual property and confidential business information held by the private sector, including COVID-19 related treatment, testing, and vaccines. Both hackers are also accused of stealing the private data of Chinese people who publicly oppose the Chinese regime, Hong Kong community organizers, and other information. As I said earlier, they have done this partially for their own personal gain, it would appear, but also for the obvious interest of the People's Republic of China's Ministry of State Security. This indictment is part of the President's China Initiative, launched in 2018, which aims at countering China's espionage and other forms of infiltration carried out by the regime. The Deputy Director of the FBI says this indictment is a warning. We're bringing these charges today to put the Chinese leaders directing these cyber attacks on notice. The FBI is looking for any information on the whereabouts of the two suspects. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Senator Josh Hawley wants to know if American companies are using slave labor in their products. He's introduced a bill after reports suggested some large corporations could be benefiting from slave labor in China. U.S. Senator Josh Hawley is introducing a bill to make sure large American companies aren't using slave labor in supply chains. The Slave Free Business Certification Act expands supply chain transparency requirements and orders regular audits. It also mandates CEOs to certify that their company's products do not rely on forced or slave labor. Companies that fail to meet these basic standards will be penalized. The bill comes off the back of a report by an Australian think tank that says more than 80 companies have been tied to forced labor in China. Some of the companies implicated in the report were Amazon, Nike, North Face, BMW and Gap. Hawley wrote on Twitter, I challenge every major American corporation making products overseas in China or elsewhere to pledge that they are slave-free and that they do not and will not rely on forced slave labor. The Chinese communist regime is well known for using prisoners of conscience in its labor camps. Two of the largest targeted groups are Falun Gong practitioners and ethnic Uyghurs. Hawley's office wrote that the issues extend beyond China. For example, Starbucks and Nespresso rely on unpaid Brazilian workers who are denied basic needs like food and water. The U.S. House has voted to ban federal employees from downloading TikTok on government-issued devices. Over 300 lawmakers voted in favor, while only 70 voted against. The Senate is expected to pass a similar bill later this week. The move comes amid rising national security concerns about TikTok, owned by Chinese tech giant ByteDance. Many fear that using the app could enable users' personal information to fall into the hands of the Chinese communist regime to be used to launch a cyber attack against the U.S. Top White House officials have said they are considering an even broader ban on Chinese-linked apps and that action may be imminent. At the other hand, TikTok said Tuesday that it plans to create 10,000 jobs in the U.S. over the next three years. Currently, it only has about 1,400 employees in the country. Now we turn to Europe. The Chinese Communist Party is considering slowing the exports of Nokia and Ericsson products made in China. The companies are Huawei's biggest rivals when it comes to producing cellular tower equipment. Should European Union members follow the lead of the U.S. and U.K. and banning Huawei from 5G networks, the Communist Party's action will likely be used to retaliate. The move comes as more and more countries are raising concerns about Huawei, including fears that data protection may not be guaranteed if towers contain equipment made by the Chinese company. China currently has a list of items under its export control, despite not having an existing export control law. These export restrictions are decided and enforced by the CCP. Now to France. France's foreign minister wants independent observers to be allowed into China's Xinjiang region. That's where many Uyghurs are reportedly being held in internment camps. France is anxious about the human rights situation there and wants the camps in the region to be closed. 
France is not the first country to push for access to the area. In the past, the UN has asked for access to the area multiple times in order to conduct an independent investigation. But the investigations have so far never happened. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on a two-day visit to the U.K., a big part of the discussion on how to tackle the growing threat of China. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo used his trip to London on Tuesday to urge other countries to follow Britain's example and push back against China. Pompeo first met with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. How are you, buddy? before holding a news conference with Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. Rather than helping the world, General Secretary Xi has shown the world the party's true face. And we talked about uh, how we've seen Hong Kong's freedoms crushed. We've watched the CCP bully its neighbors, militarize features in the South China Sea and instigate a deadly confrontation with India. He didn't stop there and went on to label China's handling of the current global health crisis as, quote, disgraceful accusing the country of a cover-up to further its own interests. We think that the entire world needs to work together to ensure that every country, including China, behaves in the international system in ways that are appropriate and consistent with the international order. You, you can't go make claims for maritime regions that you have no lawful claim to. Pompeo directly referred to the ruling Chinese Communist Party as a threat and praised the UK for deciding to drop Chinese telecoms firm Huawei for its 5G network. <laughs> for his part, Raab said the United States and other allies needed to stand up for their values on the international stage amid ratcheting tensions with both China and Russia. Also covered in the wide-ranging news conference was the possibility of a US-UK free trade deal post-Brexit. Pompeo said that there was still work to do, but he was hopeful it could be done. Leading UK lawmakers claim TikTok is as dangerous as Huawei is to Britain. TikTok is a very popular social media video sharing app owned by Beijing-based company ByteDance. In the Times today, one lawmaker raised the issue of proximity to Chinese intelligence services. There are real serious concerns as big as with Huawei over the role that they play. Other parliamentarians echoed this. TikTok denies the allegations, saying data is stored in the US. Proposals have been floated to build a global headquarters for TikTok in London. India has banned TikTok and the U.S. Secretary of State says America may follow. Huawei is revealed to have secretly bought a stake in a British company that uses artificial intelligence to spot criminals in crowds. According to The Times, Huawei Technologies Cooperative, an offshoot of Huawei, bought a 20% stake in Vision Semantics in the last two years. Vision Semantics has developed technology to spot an individual in crowd using not just their face, but their clothing, height and any objects they are carrying. Vision said the technology has been used by police forces around the world. The technology has potentially sinister applications, given that China, Huawei's homeland, has a record of mass surveillance and widespread repression. And protests in Hong Kong are still persisting. On Tuesday, small groups of Hong Kong pro-democracy demonstrators clashed with riot police inside a shopping mall. It happened on the same day as the first anniversary of the Yuanlong train station attack. During the event, protesters chanted slogans like Hong Kong independence is the only way out. Hundreds of riot police urged people not to gather, citing virus precautions and the need for social distancing. Last year's Yuanlong attack and the police's apparent failure to prevent it plunged the global financial hub into its deepest crisis since the city returned to Chinese rule in 1997. So far, protesters have been attacked by an armed crowd wearing white shirts. And police have been criticized for not immediately arresting the attackers at the scene. S&P Global says Hong Kong's specialness is being eroded and the island could see its trend growth get cut in half over the next decade or even plunge to zero. The rating agency added Hong Kong's decoupling from the U.S. and a rise in political unrest as reasons for the gloomy forecast. Washington is reviewing Hong Kong's special status after China enforced its new national security law onto the city. Hong Kong's financial industry is a cornerstone of the city's prosperity. It accounts for nearly one-fifth of the economy. That's almost double the level it had more than 20 years ago. 
The American embassy in China issued a statement on China's social media site Weibo, calling on the Chinese regime to end its persecution of the meditation practice Falun Gong. This comes after Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a statement yesterday demanding the Chinese regime and its 21-year persecution of the spiritual practice. At China's foreign ministry press briefing, a reporter brought up Pompeo's statement. So, Mr. Zhang, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And so a reporter from Hong Kong asked at China's foreign ministry spokesman, asked about uh, Pompeo's statement, so Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And so he had issued a statement on the 21st anniversary of the persecution of the spiritual practice Falun Gong. And so China's foreign ministry spokesperson said that the practice is anti-humanity. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's ironic that the, the, the perpetrator of the crime, the Chinese Communist regime, is blaming the uh, American Secretary of State for being humanitarian to lend support for uh, you know victims of uh, the Communist Party. In this case, for the practitioners, it's been uh, 21 years. Uh, with the documentation from uh, different human rights groups, including the United Nations Human Rights Council, that um, the evidence of the persecution is clear and there. Um, and there's even a horrific uh, massive organ harvesting of uh, vulnerable practitioners. All of these crimes against humanity should be condemned. Thank you so much for joining us and hope to have you on the show again. Thank you. This year, the State Department welcomed a survivor of a Chinese labor camp, Dr. Yuhua Zhang, who was tortured for her faith in Falun Dafa, to speak at the U.S. Ministerial to advance religious freedom. Dr. Zhang is the former Russian language department director at the Nanjing Normal University. Her husband was also arrested and is still imprisoned in China. We spoke with Dr. Zhang to hear her story. So, hello, Ms. Jen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. So, can you talk about your experience of being persecuted? Um, Since the Chinese regime started persecuting Falun Gong, I was arrested, jailed, and sent to a forced labor camp three times. I remember when I was detained in the Nanjing women's prison, guards didn't let me sleep on three occasions for an extended period of time. The shortest time that I was denied sleep was 15 to 20 days. The longest was almost 60 days, over 50 days. I was forced to stand for long periods of time. My legs and hands were all swollen, and my blood pressure started rising. And the labor camp wouldn't take me. So the guards forced me to take medicine and tied my forelimbs to a bed. One guard forced my head back and stuffed the tube down my nose and poured the medicine and other substances down my nose. After that, my whole body started having spasms, and my muscles ached, and my head felt tight, and I had difficulty breathing. After being so severely persecuted, why do you still persist in your faith? Firstly, I believe religious freedom is a basic human right. No one can deny that. Additionally, before practicing Falun Gong, my body was in very poor health. I had several different illnesses. After practicing Falun Gong, my illnesses vanished. Another reason is Falun Gong teaches people to be good people. It teaches people to be considerate of others. So I want to be a good person. So I think I should defend my human rights. But not giving up in mainland China means being tortured. So that's how hard it is. And lastly, what is your greatest wish? From my own personal experience and from the experiences of people around me, and then adding this time the pandemic and the national security law being imposed on Hong Kong, I believe the root cause of my personal suffering and many suffering of the entire humanity is the Chinese Communist Party. My one great wish is the end of the widespread persecution of Falun Gong. 
those who were detained and jailed because of their belief, and for the Chinese Communist Party to be held accountable. Another wish I have is for all the world's people who cherish peace and democracy to unite together and disintegrate the Chinese Communist Party. Let us live in a world free of the Communist Party. Thank you so much for joining us today. Millions of dollars from the federal government's Paycheck Protection Program are flowing to companies and organizations tied to the Chinese Communist Party. These include socialism advocators, CCP state-owned enterprise collaborators, partners of China's Confucius Institutes, and more. The New York-based China Institute, a partner of China's Confucius Institute, has received up to $1 million from the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, loans. Founded in 1926, China Institute has a nearly 100-year history of working alongside the Chinese Communist Party. The advocacy group hosted the first Confucius Institute in New York in 2006, working in partnership with the East China Normal University. It's a state-funded university that states in its bylaws the Communist Party Committee shall make collective decisions and that the university president shall implement the collective decisions. Their collaboration eventually led to Confucius Institutes taking root in nine U.S. K-12 schools. Similarly, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations also received up to $1 million from the Paycheck Protection Program. Like the China Institute, its Confucius Institute partner did as well. According to the Confucius Institute newsletter, the committee has been holding annual joint conferences with the University of Delaware's Confucius Institute since 2010. The meetings are dubbed Chinatown Halls. The newsletter describes the conference as an occasion where talents from Delaware politics, economics, business and academia come together for important dialogue on U.S.-China relations. Yet another pro-Chinese Communist Party organization that is receiving PPP funds is the 46-year-old Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco. According to the U.S. Treasury Department's records, it too received up to $1 million from the federal government. According to communism expert and author Trevor Loudon, the Progressive Chinese Association was founded by key members of IWK, an organization that claims to apply the science of Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought to the U.S. revolution. It also has a strong connection with the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. Eurozone shares reached their highest since March on Tuesday as markets welcomed news of an EU recovery deal. The almost $860 billion stimulus plan is designed to help European economies hit hard by coronavirus. After a tense five-day summit, EU leaders agreed around $446 billion will be handed out as grants rather than lent to countries most in need of stimulus, while just over $411 billion will go out as cheap loans. The grants will be given to countries which present job-creating plans that strengthen their growth potential and the resilience of their economies. French President Emmanuel Macron. The conclusions of this summit are truly historic. We've set up a capacity to borrow collectively to put in place a collective recovery plan for the first time. The grants forced the bloc to generate cash to repay borrowing by 2058. Leaders agreed green measures to raise the cash. It includes a tax on non-recycled plastic with the proceeds going to EU coffers. Another feature of the deal sees net contributors to the EU budget, like the Netherlands and Germany, receive much deeper rebates than before on what they have to contribute each year to EU accounts, based on the size of their economies. In early trade, an index of Eurozone stocks rose 1.3% to touch its highest level since March 5th. A leading industry group says up to one-third of New York City's 230,000 small businesses may never reopen. That's according to a new report from the Partnership for New York City. The organization released its post-pandemic response plan Monday. It assesses the impact of the outbreak on New York and suggests actions for recovery. It found that most small businesses in New York City have less than three months' worth of cash reserves. 
This means that funds to restart, pay back rent, and buy inventory are exhausted. The report also said the sudden freeze on travel and tourism had a devastating impact on the hospitality, retail, and food service industries. More than two out of every five vulnerable jobs in New York City are in small businesses that employ fewer than 100 people. The biggest challenges to business owners, according to the report, are high rents, regulatory burdens, and taxes. The study says any recovery must be based on solid health measures in place to deal with a resurgence. That includes a robust testing and tracing program. Other action points include greater capital access and technical assistance for small businesses, as well as regulatory and tax reform. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.